Hey Refuge Church, I'm so blessed to be with you guys another week talking about shalom and tamim, or well-being and wholeness, and God's desire for that for us. I'm so excited uh, to jump into our main question this week, so I'll pray and we'll dive in. God, I thank you that you care about us. I thank you that um, you are not annoyed by our woundedness. You are not surprised by the place that we have hurt, bitterness, resentment, confusion. I thank you that you have endless patience for us and love for us. Um, and I ask that you would be with us and minister to us, send us your wisdom and your insight um, and your spirit as we look at what relationship with you means and how we might interact with that and what it might look like for us. I thank you again and ask that you would be with us and especially me as I um, seek to teach your word. I ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, yes, so Shalom and Tamim, we've been talking about well-being and wholeness, how God commands us to uh, work on these things, to have these things. Um, in the first week, we talked about uh, Pizza Cazeros. We did a, his check-in list. 10 uh, signs that we might have some unhealth. And the next week we looked at Dr. Uh, Doug Shirley's list of how, um, how we might be dealing with our pain and more healthy ways to do it. And we looked into scriptural uh, background of those suggestions. Um, the week after that, what did we do? We looked at Sky Jathani's list of ways and postures about some unhealthy ways that we can relate to God. Sometimes we try to live uh, under God or over God or from God or for God. And he brought us to the conclusion that we ought to live with God, that that's been his original design that he would find his dwelling place within us and that he would be walking with us and we with him. So how do we do that? What's that look like? That's what we're going to be talking about today. So often we just say relationship with God and that just means like prayer and Bible study or something and that's all that we talk about. Um, and so I wanna lay some foundational principles First, going forward so that when we get to this nitty-gritty fun practical stuff of figuring out what kind of spiritual practices resonate with you and are helpful for you and the way God designed you um, we can still have these in our pocket and not end up in these unhealthy ways of doing things um, or feel like there's something wrong and end up dropping something that's helpful for us because this other creepy tendency is started sneaking in again put up walls against creepy unhealthiness, right? So um, before I jump into the scientist that brings us some helpful research, um, I wanted to talk about the difference between the Protestant classic traditional um, structure of what Christian -like life looks like and the Roman Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox, both churches, um, their structure of what Christian life looks like. Now there's nothing wrong with Protestants and there's also nothing wrong with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters and Orthodox brothers and sisters. They're part of the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12 that um, Urgis is on and uh, we love. So let's learn from them today. So in the Protestant worldview, when we talk theology and we talk Christian life, we talk three main things. If you thought about them, you could probably come up with them on your own, uh, but do the work for you. The first one is conversion, right? Huge focus for uh, many Christians working in the church is just getting people to conversion. The second is sanctification. Um, so conversion being usually in their terms, giving your life over to Jesus, letting Jesus into your heart, whatever, obtaining salvation for that person so that they can go on and experience eternal life, often framed in the future context. And sanctification, um, sanctification, right, comes from sanctus, um, which is related as holiness in Latin. Um, holiness in English, by the way, comes from uh, the Old English and the Old Norse word that uh, stands for health. So that's kind of ironic because 
never heard a sermon um, putting holiness in the same terms of health. But um, instead, it usually reflects when we talk about holiness, the process of becoming holier, transforming to look more like Jesus, which there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but it's often correctly tied, perhaps correctly, to the Hebrew understanding of Kadesh, is the word for holy. Um, and that just means to be set apart, right? You've probably heard that. But what happens in the Protestant world um, is that we say, okay, I'm supposed to be set apart. And sometimes we lose our anchor of how is God set apart? God is set apart uh, by being loving to the world, by being the perfect, unending, patient, slow to anger, steadfast um, to a thousand generations forgiving love. And that's how he's different from all the other gods um, and from everyone else in the world, right? And so we forget that and we say set apart from the world and divorced from that, we start thinking, okay, the world watches these movies. So what kind of movies should we watch? The world has these politics. So what should my politics be like? The world has um, these music preferences, these clothing preferences. So mine need to be different than that. Now, is there anything wrong with dressing differently than the world, different music than the world? No, different movies, Christian movies, anything wrong with them? Yes, that's mostly a joke. Um, no, there's nothing inherently wrong with the idea of Christian movies or anything else that's Christian branded, but that's not the heart of what it needs to be set apart. Um, we're gonna circle back to that in a second, but the third stage in the Christian life, uh, according to mainline Protestant theology, is glorification, which is when we die and we go to heaven, we will be transformed, and no longer will we be sinful and perfect beings, but rather we will be perfect, we'll be healed, have new different bodies, or the same bodies restored, um, or be spirits for a while, depending on what your theology of post-death is, right? So conversion, sanctification, and glorification. So one of the things about that structure is conversion for most of us is something that already happened. It was a single point of time in the past. And depending on how Calvinist you are, you may or may not have had that much to do with your conversion. Your glorification at the end is a single point in time future, which won't happen while you're alive and that you have nothing to do with, right? So that means the whole focus of your entire life comes down to sanctification. And so everything gets put into that bucket of me being a Christian means being set apart, means being different, which I'm not saying is totally wrong again. But let's learn from our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters and Eastern Orthodox as, as well. Um, Pope Innocent, either the ninth or the 11th ratified um, this three-part structure for what Christian life looks like. And it's taken a lot from the works of St. Teresa of Avila, Avila, I'm not sure, um, and St. John of the Cross. So also three parts, but the first one is called purgation, um, as in purge, right? And some of our bad stereotypes about Catholicism might come into play here. We're not talking about um, da Vinci Code style whipping ourselves on the back. That's not it's not uh, what we're looking for here. Purgation is twofold idea. Number one uh, is we are detaching from the world. I'm gonna circle circle around that. Detaching from the world and its desires specifically. And then second, confession of sin. Those are the two steps to purgation. So um, when we talk detachment from the world and its desires, I want to put in an extra thing here. Um, sometimes we can detach because it's easy um, and because we're not being compassionate and we're not being fully here in the world um, doing what God has called us to do. That's not the kind of detachment uh, that I think purgation is speaking of. 
while yes, uh, these communities do have people who go up and live in monasteries, the idea is that those priests or nuns or monks are also very much in their community and serving communion to people who can't come out of their homes, bringing food to people who are not able to go to the grocery store, going and praying for people, doing healings, anointing people, etc. They're always while detached in their case, we're saying no to capitalism and saying no to materialism and going and living in this community. Um, they were still very much in the world with blessing other people, right? We don't want to say, oh, I don't need to worry about X, Y, or Z justice issue because I should be detached from the world. That's cheating, that's not what we're talking about. But number two, the second part of purgation is confession of sin. Now, what makes these two things different than the sanctification mindset, especially with that fundamentalist application that I just kind of talked about, um, where you're really getting into these cultural, culture wars issues. Um, whereas that tradition has you getting your claws in, pointing the finger at the other people, saying, yeah, you watch, uh, watch or read Harry Potter, but they shouldn't be in schools, so we should ban it. Um, on the other hand, detachment from the world and its desires says, yeah, the world's gonna do whatever. And maybe maybe they're reading Game of Thrones in schools. <laughs> it's not ideal maybe, but uh, they're not getting into the nitty gritty. They are feeling that they are um, detached in some way. And so they don't need to be down slugging it out because they are serving a higher purpose. That's the hope. And then while the part of sanctification and in that nitty gritty culture war mindset has a lot of finger pointing and saying, you're doing this and you aren't dressed modestly enough and you need to be X, Y, Z. Confession of sin requires humility and it requires community. First John 1, 9 says that if we, are, uh, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the idea is, yes, with humility, you go to your community and share um, in what way you have made an error, missed the mark, right, is the word in Hebrew, not in Hebrew, Greek and Hebrew. Um, and then you are then cleansed from your unrighteousness. So the focus is getting to that place. Um, and we always get distracted by stereotypical tropes about penance and such, which may or may not be true in a particular Catholic community. So that's purgation. That's the first thing in this alternate view of Christian life. Purgation, which is made up of confession of sin and detachment. Hopefully a healthy detachment. Number two is illumination. And illumination is defined as the personal experience of God and his love and peace. The personal experience of God and his love and peace is illumination. And this is the second step in the way that they think about Christian life. We have totally divorced that, right? We have, you should look different. And so you should do these practices. And hopefully along the way, you'll, you know, experience Jesus in your daily life. Nope. Being with Jesus, experiencing the spirit, Romans 5, 5. Um, experiencing love and joy, that is central to this different idea of what the Christian life looks like. So purgation, illumination, and the last is union. This is also all through the New Testament, right? Uh, we are to be on Christ and Christ is in us. John 15, he is the vine, we are the branches. Abide in me and I will abide in you and my joy might be in you. Uh, the epistles of John 1, 2, and 3, that his love might be in us etc. It's we are in God and he is in us and we are in God and he is in us. That's union, which again does not come up uh, in the Protestant theological model. So with those things in mind, okay, a whole nother sector of Christianity really values confession and detachment, personal experience of Jesus and his love and peace and being in him and him and me. We also see this in Philippians 3, verse 8 and first part of 9, which we quoted last week, but it's considering all these things as loss, I set them aside and considered them as dung, that's detachment 
from worldly desires, right? From saying, oh, I need prestige and I need to have the perfect house and I need to be making this much salary, etc. Setting aside all those things for the surpassing worth of knowing, that's gnosis, that's da'at in Hebrew, that's the experiential intimate knowledge. Um, so for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, so that's illumination, that I might be found in him, the first part of verse 9, that's union. So we have all three in that Philippians passage, pretty, pretty cool. Okay, so the research that we're going to look at today, I love, it's by Dr. David Benner, um, and he has been published in scientific journals um, of clinical psychology. He works with um, children who are coming out of trauma. He has a center for children who've experienced trauma and torture in South Africa. Um, all sorts of amazing work, but he's also written lots and lots of books, which are wonderful, on the intersection of science and spirituality. He really looks at spiritual life flourishing in your relationship with God as the other part of his research. So he's perfect for us. This is kind of a crash course um, in kind of the contemplative lifestyle. If you've ever heard anyone talk about the Desert Fathers, this is this kind of spirituality. Um, a little crash course, little invitation to that. So he's asking the, friend, the question, how do we become friends with God, right? David, King David, asks that in, um, uh, or he's described as being a friend of God and um, Samuel and Kings, right? And the Tanakh. Um, how do we cultivate those experiences of love and peace that illumination talks about? Um, that harmony, he defines union as harmony between us and God because we cannot force friendship, right? You can't force an intimate, true friendship with anybody. It just doesn't work. Um, people are individuals. And it's the same with God. Sometimes we think we can control God, we can manipulate God by setting up these certain things. And if I do this, God is obligated to do this. God is a person, just like every other being, right? And so we cannot, we cannot force this. Um, and anybody who tries to tell you otherwise is selling something. Uh, Princess Bride reference. Um, but so what he talks about of instead of trying to force relationship with God, instead what you can do is cultivate soul hospitality. I love, love this concept, soul hospitality, especially fits in with our understanding of Tanakh and um, Middle Eastern culture, right, is huge on hospitality and we see that all through the stories um, in Tanakh. And so applying that to ourselves, how can I have soul hospitality? All these things apply to God, and I'm going to be focusing on that. But you can also apply them to yourself. Do I have soul hospitality for myself? And then also for other people. Am I doing this well? Am I being a good spiritual friend to people? So just, uh, just some ideas to mull through. So Dr. David Benner talks about this. He points out before we get into anything about soul hospitality, the first step is feeling safe. You cannot be friends with someone with whom you do not feel safe. Um, if you still feel queasy about all this and everything we've been talking about um, and that we're getting into, I hope that you feel curious and excited and hopeful. Um, but if you still feel queasy, it might be that because of these experiences and intended to hurt um, and bad theology, you could still feel like God church, spirituality, and therefore God are um, unsafe. And if you do feel that way, you're completely accepted. Uh, and we would love to talk with you, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or during group, join us on Zoom 7.30 PST uh, Sunday nights. We'd love to chat with you about that in a very open way about what your experiences have, have been judgment-free zone. So that's the first, the first thing. So if you feel like, oh boy, I'm not ready for this, that is okay. And that might be a reason why. But soul hospitality for whenever you are ready, or for people who do feel curiosity, sacred curiosity, the first part of soul hospitality is making space for the friendship, for the relationship. We already know this intuitively. If you're trying to be friends with someone, 
a regular human being um, and you're trying to meet them for the first time in a long time uh, and you come over to their house and the TV is blurring and their kids are screaming and whacking each other uh, and you're trying to talk to them while they're you know running around doing other things that probably works a lot better if you already have a really close friendship with them but if you're just meeting someone and you're trying to form this first intimate uh, part of the relationship that is not going to work particularly well so making space uh is important and sometimes the only time we talk to god is when things are crazy <laughs> might be at the hospital or at work something's really emotional there's a ton of stuff going on and that's when we pray shooting an arrow but into the sky like <laughs> Ah, I need help and of course we don't hear anything back because there's chaos all around us there's nothing wrong with those prayers however we might think um, to ourselves next time we want to try to create space to talk to God have relationship with God be mindful about what kind of space we have um, what kind of time are you carving out for yourself to be able to do this it's not just going to appear just like any other relationship you don't automatically enter into a romantic re relationship a friendship relationship whatever it is just spontaneously out of nowhere you have to be intentional so step one in soul hospitality is make space number two from dr david benner is you have to practice presence right this kind of plays into the previous thing um, if the person with the kids for screaming is incredibly skillful um, and you know them pretty well you can still talk to them in that because you know that they are attentive to you despite everything going on even in the chaos um, but for us when we're practicing presence and we aren't intensely skillful at being able to talk with God all day long um, we want to do so by being still being present also looks like being genuine right if we're trying to manipulate God if we're trying to control him if we are trying to perform and do a really good job being the best Christian that's not being present right that's being in your own head thinking like oh I want good things so what should I do to get it or well I know I'm supposed to pray like this or I know that somebody else pray like that and I probably should too so it should look like this that's not being genuine that's not being present being present is being still being genuine to who you are without posturing manipulating or pretending um, and it's being attentive and focused right it doesn't happen in an instant life from God often tells us that we'll be in chaos in the bottom you know last few inches of the barrel of our life and all of a sudden God breaks through Ta -da! and uh, your cycle of addiction is broken, for instance, which is wonderful and amazing and totally happens, praise God. But if we walk around expecting our regular relationship with God to look like that, we're gonna be really surprised or we're gonna manufacture crisis constantly in order to keep experiencing that high, right? But that's not what regular relationship and friendship looks like. You need to practice attentiveness, stillness, being genuine. Um, and paying attention and being focused to listen um, and then the third aspect of soul hospitality is dialogue so this is predicated on the other factors right you can't have dialogue with someone if you're not paying attention you're not being present um, and the space is total chaos um, dialogue takes respecting yourself and respecting the other person right to true dialogue is not um, the way many of my prayers in the past have looked before me writing out this bay, you need me, blah, 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 and I can't do it, blah, 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 blah. God is not surprised by those things. Uh, God is loving and patient and loves me through those kinds of prayers and can love you through those kinds of prayers too, but that is not dialogue. So there's nothing wrong with that. But when we're cultivating and creating soul hospitality in our soul is a beautiful house and a beautiful room where we say come in i would love to speak with you i would love to just be with you with right we'd love to dwell with you um true dialogue is not <laughs> uh right we want to make space um to hear back right and if we're always just talking um or yelling 
we can't always hear, right? Um, it also takes a vulnerability um, and trust to share and listen. If we are so focused on praying right, if we're focused on doing it the right way. Um, a couple of years ago, we were in a, a church environment in which we we're all supposed to pray with a certain formula um, that was called taco. And it started with thankfulness and adoration and confession. And then I don't remember what the O is, but that was one you were allowed to ask. So you couldn't ask for something until you had done all these other things, right? And I don't know how it's possible um, to be present with someone. I don't know how with your spouse, if you wanted just to share with your spouse, how was your day, how that'll work if first you have to say, my spouse, you are glorious today. I adore you. Um, it's good to be thankful. It's good to enjoy your spouse. It's good to compliment your spouse. Um, but lining up all those things, doing it in a certain way is not conducive to authentic vulnerability that gets into performative mode so fast where we think I did everything right. And so therefore God will honor my request. That's trying to control God again. That's life over God. That's saying I have these techniques and principles and I'm going to apply them to you. Um, those techniques and principles can be so comforting because it feels like we have control, but then it doesn't last because when God doesn't come through, um, potentially because he's annoyed by that formula, um, then we feel totally shattered, like God isn't even there and what could possibly be going on, right? So I want to invite us, invite us um, as we start this journey in the coming weeks of looking at all these different ways um, that we can practice, that we can create space to have hospitality with God. Um, I want us to be thinking about how am I being um, wise in making space where I can hear from God well, right? How am I being present with God? Um, how am I allowing for respectful dialogue with God? Might be new concepts um, for us, especially if we've been raised in different church environments. And then of course, making sure before we do any of that, do I feel safe? Because we want to experience the fullness of the amazing frontier, the unexplored zones of adventure that lie for us um, out in the wilderness. God has prepared for each one of us individual adventures of knowing him and following him and pursuing them. And they are awe-inspiring and joyous and so exciting to embark on. And we miss out when we don't make space and we don't have soul hospitality to be able to hear what it is that God's saying to us. Um, don't know if you've ever had the joy of an amazing hospitality experience of whether you know the person really well or not, they say, oh, just come over, don't worry about it. And you know that they don't mean something else, they really do mean that, and you just come over, and they've made the most amazing food, it's delicious, it's good for you, so you don't feel gross afterwards, um, but not so good for you, that you're like, oh, yay. Um, there's amazing drink, you get to just sit and be with them and laugh and share stories. Um, and they cultivate, there's usually music and beautiful lighting, um, and they speak things that are helpful and fun and life-giving, and you're able to share and just enjoy being together. Hopefully, at some point, someone has blessed you with an experience of hospitality like that. We want to create that space for other people, both literally uh, by opening up our homes, but also spiritually, just with our words and our demeanor and our attitudes, giving them full space to be themselves, full presence of genuine attention and focus, um, and then also dialogue of really listening and asking good questions and respectfully and lovingly sharing with vulnerability back. We want to do that for other people, but we also want to do that for ourselves. Have you made space with yourself? to be able to honor your own need for stillness and quiet? Have you been able to be present with yourself and saying, how am I really feeling and attending to that and not shoving it under the table? Have you been able to have dialogue with yourself of, oh, I'm noticing that I'm feeling anxious and afraid. Why might that be? Maybe it's because I'm afraid that people aren't going to, etc. 
But then lastly, we want to be doing that with God, of course, and maybe taking that image with you of what that feels like, of that dinner that I hope that you've experienced at some point can help us when we settle in, when we embark off um, in the coming weeks and all the different ways that we can experience God. I've got nine, nine different kinds of a pursuer that you might be, nine kinds of different spiritual person that you might be. It's not nine activities, it's nine different kinds of ways that you might interact with God. And I'm so excited, but I want to make sure that when we're going into that, this is what we're cultivating, hospitality, making space to meet with God. So I'm going to pray. Um, I hope that you will join us either in person or uh, on Zoom, 7.30 p.m. on Sundays, Pacific time. The questions are in the PDF below along with a Philippians verse. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that's it. Oh, and you can always give at refugepullman.com. Okay, God, I thank you that you long to meet with us. I ask that we would desire to meet with you like a deer at this stream. I thank you that you are the great rock in the desert um, that gives us shade, that the experience of you is good. I ask that you would help us be able to taste and see that you are good. Um, I ask that you would um, be faithful to us as we try in whatever ways it might look like for us to make that space um, that you would um, that you would show up that we might get to see who you really are and get to know you maybe in a different contemplative way than we have ever been able to know you before um, I thank you for the insights of Dr. Benner um, and I ask that you would be with all of us as we go out this week and that you would bless our discussions um, I ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. See you guys next week.